uh, we're talking about a universe of people. There are disfigured people in every country of the world. There's disfigured children, there's disfigured adults. Disfigurement has, I don't want to say nothing, but I think very little to do with um, economic means or um, you know, nationality. Um, disfigurement is found in every society. Uh, there's uh, cleft palates, children born with cleft palates. There are people like me who are injured in accidents. Um, there's cancer survivors who go through surgery on their face and are forever different. There are people who are born with um, you know, bad birthmarks. So disfigurement is found everywhere. Uh, there was a study done in yeah, 2017 talking about, they, they polled people who were disfigured and ask them what they experience. And so the first thing that people experience all the time when they are disfigured is being stared at. And so uh, I just want to kind of um, demonstrate that for you. Uh, <laughs> that's what that's like. How'd that feel? <laughs> so we get stared at frequently, especially by little kids, but also by adults. The second thing that we encounter frequently is um, the avoidant look. And the avoidant look is better than that, but not much. So this, this goes like this. And how did that feel? About the same, right? The avoidant look sends, lets us know that our face is so bad to look at that they're pretending we're not there, okay? Then there are the people, and this really does happen all the time, and they think they're being nice, who say, Sorry, people in the front row, I'm picking on you. <laughs> oh, you're so brave. Oh, I admire you so much. Which makes you feel like what? Um, well, like you're being talked down to. Right, like you're being talked down to. It's a, it's a feeling of being less than. And again, that happens all the time. And those are people who think they're being nice. <laughs> they really do. Um, when, when we go out in public, uh, again, some people will, um, the first thing they'll do, uh, what are you? Like before they say hello, before they smile, um, and I sort of ask you to imagine if there was something about you that maybe wasn't your favorite thing about you. Perhaps you were uh, overweight, and someone said, what happened to you? And you'd be like, <laughs> right? I mean, nobody wants the thing that they're struggling with to be the first thing that some stranger just says to you. Um, people do make negative comments, like the children I was talking about in my reading, you know, ugh, I don't hear, ugh, that happens. Um, there are, uh, and we will get into this in a little bit, there is absolutely job discrimination and low expectations placed on people with disfigurement, which, I mean, maybe that sounds good, they don't expect much, but it doesn't feel good because it, it puts us down. Um, you know, I, I got my doctorate from Tufts, like I'm a pretty smart person, and I have really good social skills, and when I went to apply to be a waitress when I was 17, like all my other friends, Nobody hired me. I couldn't get a waitressing job. I don't think they wanted my face to be the first thing they saw. Also, I want to just kind of say as I go into this, I, the, however I look now, which I acknowledge is like not half bad, this is like <laughs> seven, I don't know, 60 operations, okay? All right. And maybe I'll, I'll, I'll to, to ramp up to this, I will also take off my jacket so you can see that in addition to my face, I am very much scarred all over. Um, there's bullying, like what I mentioned in the book. Um, there, 
Now with the internet, um, there is social media trolling of people um, who are disabled and disfigured. I heard the most horrific story recently uh, of a lovely man in the UK who is very badly disfigured and he found a site on, uh, I think it was Instagram, where people were ranking people's faces and attractiveness on a scale of one to 10. And a 10 was a supermodel. And a one was his face. And he couldn't get them to take it down. So I, I also know, like for example, I had a friend who contacted me and said, oh, you have a friend who's trying to be my friend on Facebook, but he's not showing his face. And I'm like, he's not showing his face because his face is so disfigured, he probably doesn't want it out there. She's like, oh. So there's a lot of um, limitations put on people who feel uncomfortable sharing their face on social media. And then there's the dating sites. <coughs> swipe left, swipe right. I don't have a swipe. Is it right, is that good? I think right's good, right? I don't have that kind of face. I have that kind of personality but I don't have that kind of face. And even before then, when I was younger and I was trying to date, before all this, I went to um, like a dating site person and she interviewed me and at the end of the interview, and I'm like telling her all these things, you know, I'm like doctorate, I'm like all doing all this cool stuff, but at the end of it she said, you know, I do have a client and he has a hair lift and I think you'd make a good match. And I'm like, I have nothing against your client with a hair lift, but like, do we have anything in common? <laughs> like, that's not, I don't want to just be matched up because we are equally disfigured. That's not anything. So it's really, really hard for us with disfigurement in this world. I think maybe some of you have heard of implicit bias, bias tests on here. That's it, that's great. Okay, great. So um, I heard of implicit bias tests when I was learning um, in my lifelong learn to understand racism. That's how I learned about it. So they've done implicit bias tests for disfigured people too. Nine out of 10 people in the first study had a difficulty associating positive qualities with a disfigured face. And that study was replicated a few years later and it was better, seven out of 10. So a lot of us do have this unconscious negative bias against the disfigured. We don't mean to. You know, I think if you ask somebody, like, how do you feel about just forget people, they'd be like, fine. <laughs> I mean, well, they might say, I feel kind of sorry for them, but fine, like, we're not, we don't mean to think negatively about just forget people. But it's in our unconscious. And I want to kind of show you a little bit about how I think it got there. And before I go to the next slide, I just want to ask you if you would kind of share with me um, what, what are the physical qualities that make a person beautiful? Just shout them out. Eyes. Eyes, right. And are the eyes symmetrical or not symmetrical? Symmetrical. Symmetrical. <laughs> what else? What makes a person beautiful? Good hair. Good hair. Uh-huh. Yep. Smile. Mm -hmm. Straight white teeth. Yeah. Smile, straight white teeth, right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, buff, right? Built uh, for a man, right? For sure. And for a woman, curvy, beautiful skin, of course, right? Who are the beautiful characters in Disney movies? Princesses. Princesses, and what do those princesses look like? <laughs> Are they beautiful? Yeah. They're all beautiful, right? Mm -hmm. And are they good? Are there bad princesses? Well, I would say that generally speaking, they are kind and sweet and noble and generous and kind to animals and good to dwarves and all kinds of things. Um, this is Belle from Beauty and the Beast. Her name literally means beautiful, right? 
the beautiful characters in uh, Star Wars are all the good ones, right? Luke and Princess Leia, they're all beautiful. Lord of the Rings, they're all lovely. So we were getting the message from very early on that beautiful is good. Um, who are the disfigured people that you know of in um, TV shows or movies, cartoons? Hunchback of Notre Dame, right? Who else? Oh, there's a lot of them. Hmm. Captain Hook. Captain Hook, right? <laughs> no, uh, his name is about his yeah. deformity, right? Okay. So, uh, we'll start with our friend the Beast here. So, so the Beast, before he was the Beast even, he was a handsome prince, remember? And he, um, he wasn't nice though. He was mean to people and he wasn't generous and he uh, was kind of a bully. So then he was turned into a beast because he was bad. And when he learned to be nice again and generous to Belle, he became handsome again. Kids are watching this stuff <laughs> from like two, three, four years old. This is the message they're getting. But it's not just beast or beauty. This is where they're supposed to be sound. So I'm just gonna sing it to you. <laughs> dum 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 da dum dum da dum. <laughs> <laughs> so there's Darth Vader and Emperor Palatine, and they are both. Burned people. They, 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 okay. Darth Vader was like a good guy before he was burned, and now he's bad. And Emperor Palatine, apparently, I don't really know him, but my husband said he was bad, but then after he got burned, he got really much worse. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's not just that. Every one of these people is disfigured. Every one. Scar is literally known by the name Scar, right? I wrote a, a piece on this called The Phantom Darth Vader and Me. Uh, <laughs> this is what disfigured people are up against, unconsciously. People aren't walking around and saying, oh, they're just like Darth Vader. I mean, like, they're not, of course. But this is what is out there and what we're up against. And I really ask you to think if you can find many other groups, if any other group, that has literally no mass media representation of them that is positive. So this is one trope evil, disfigured trope. But there is <clears throat> one other way disfigurement is portrayed in the media. You came to it. It is, disfigurement means you're pathetic. You might not be evil. You might actually be a good person, but you're pathetic. So the Hunchback of Notre Dame makes my skin crawl. Have, have, how many of you have seen the Hunchback of Notre Dame? Okay, quite a few, not everybody, but quite a few. So the story of the Hunchback of Notre Dame is that he is you know, born disfigured and he is so hideous that he must stay only in the bell tower of Notre Dame and his only friends are gargoyles. I'm not kidding. And at one point he does manage to go out and when people actually look at his face and realize that it's not a mask, he starts a riot because people can't bear to look at him. And at the end of the movie, it is a happy ending for him, sort of, kind of, a little bit. There's this woman who takes pity on him. He loves her. She doesn't love him because, like, why would she? He's the hunchback of Notre Dame. But she's nice to him. 
And at the end, he has a friend, and he doesn't have to live in the bell tower anymore. And that's like as good as it gets for the Hunchback of Notre Dame. And then there's this guy. I don't know if any of you ever read or saw the movie Me Before You. So Me Before You is about this, this incredibly handsome and wealthy man who um, is in an accident and he is quadriplegic. And all he wants to do, being quadriplegic, incredibly handsome, incredibly wealthy, and he has this beautiful woman who loves him and everything he could want in the world, the only thing he wants is to die. And at the end of the movie, he gets to die. Then there's the elephant man who just basically hides behind his mask the whole time and when his mask is taken off, he starts riots and everybody's mean to him. So if you're not evil in the media, you are pathetic. And again, I want to share all of this with you. First of all, it's kind of interesting. But second of all, to understand why it is that it's in our brains, these negative biases against disfigured people. Again, we don't mean them, they're there, and they got there for reasons. <clears throat> so, there's three basic assumptions about disability and how disability is caused. The first one is the moral explanation. You're disabled or disfigured because you, you're evil, you've done something bad, it's God's punishment. Okay, that sounds like medieval, and it is. Um, it's been around, you know, thousands of years as an explanation for why people were born a certain way that it was a curse on your family. Um, but that still is a little bit in our heads, actually. Um, and I will tell you that lots of people who are disfigured will tell you that people will come up to you and say, like, well, they'll come up to me, were you playing with matches? First of all, no. <laughs> but second of all, like, you know, and immediately it must be my fault in some way, right? And that, that is alive and a well in, in a lot of our brains. And I think also it serves as a psychological defense mechanism, mechanism, like, well, I'm not doing anything bad, so that won't happen to me. The um, second uh, model is the medical model, which is that disability or disfigurement is caused by something medical that's happened. Um, and, uh, and that's true. But that model is also very limiting because the assumption is, so something medical has happened and um, especially with disfigurement, like it's up to you to fix it and you should fix it. And there's a, a belief that, you know, plastic surgery can fix everything, which is, you know, it can fix a lot. I look a lot better than I used to, but I'm still burned and I can't fix everything. I don't have a lifetime to have all the surgeries I would have to have in order to be fully fixed. And by the way, that's not even possible. So the medical model places the burden on the patient that you should fix it. Oh, and we're not even getting into, do you have the money to fix it? Do you have the health insurance to fix it? Do you live in a country that has doctors that can fix it? So it places the burden very much on the patient and the you know, healthcare system. The third model about disability and disfigurement is that this is a societal issue. And it is up to us to include people. Um, and it's really more or less a social problem that we're placed in to be um, uh, shunned and uh, excluded. And it's up to us as a society to fix that. Um, people with disfigurement like this model. And I will say, um, how many of you wear glasses? Okay, that's about half the room. You're all dis you're all disabled. You're all disabled. You are visually disabled. But it doesn't feel that way, right? Because we fix it <laughs> and we accept it, and it's cheap to fix it, and you can get glasses and it's not that hard, and we don't look at people with glasses like matter with you. So there is very much a societal flavor to how we look at these things that can be changed. There's a face equality movement that was started in 2008 by a wonderful man named James Partridge in the UK. 
looking at facial disfigurement as being a global human rights issue. And I'm gonna read what they say the goal is just because it, I think it's so beautiful, I want to say it out loud and speak it into the room. Face equality has the goal of creating a world in which people who have disfigurements to their face from any cause are accepted and valued as equal citizens, free of prejudice, low expectations, and stigma. The campaign has attracted worldwide attention and has strong parallels with those against racism and sexism. There's a number of organizations doing this kind of work now. There's Changing Faces in the UK, Phoenix Society for Burn Survivors, I'm a member of that, that's uh, burn survivors all around the world, their families, doctors, firefighters. Face Equality, which is um, now a movement all around the globe now, uh, of NGOs aligning towards that goal that I just read to you, and the Sunshine Foundation in Taiwan, and many more. So this is the point where I wanna play two videos they are in, they're actually subtitled, so it's maybe okay if we don't have the sound. I wish we would, just because you could hear some laughing in a way that I think might be helpful. Is there any way to do that or no? 